Maybe just a quick question. How many of you have written a Mesos framework or a DCO service before? Max, yes, I know. <laughs> All right, there's one more uh, hand. Pretty cool. So uh, I hope we can show you like the basics and actually like this talk is gonna be focused more on the challenges which actually arise if you want to write st stateful services. But we'll also actually show some approach, making it really easy to come up with new frameworks or new services. So for all of those who haven't done it yet, it's going to be like an easier start than, for example, I know like RangoDB, they were one of the first ones, they had a pretty rough time, which we're also going to see throughout this talk. So, us, that's actually uh, Ken here. Ken is a distributed uh, systems engineer at Mesosphere, and uh, it's a dear colleague. And uh, he was actually one of the persons who started this SDK we're going to talk about during this talk. And I myself, I'm also a distributed systems engineer, uh, so I mostly work in the Apache Mesos project, but I also like go out throughout the world, talk about stuff, and actually help partners, like for example, Max over here, writing those services and frameworks. So this is why I also really like to see that we have something like an SDK, making it easier for people to get started and actually allowing us to get more services running on uh, both Mesos and DCOS. All right, maybe the first question, the title of the talk was actually writing stateful frameworks, writing stateful services. So maybe the first question, why does it matter in such kind of like microservice world? I actually just looked at the uh, top X Docker Hub images and there's actually a pattern like, if you check like a year ago or so, there were like really few stateful services, but over time, uh, I actually marked all the ones which have like some stateful service uh, or some stateful containers, for example, MySQL, MongoDB, the Docker registry. So actually even like in the Docker store, in the Docker hub, a lot of the uh, repositories, a lot of the images are stateful images. So we're seeing that despite we are moving towards this microservice world, still state is a really important and as we'll see, state is also pretty hard. The, Second thing which we, if we talk about state, uh, is actually that we see like a lot of those big data frameworks, which was actually also one of the initial motivations to come up with something like Mesos to basically enable all those frameworks to run like on the same cluster. So actually like the challenge right now is how do we combine all those stateful services together with potentially all those stateful containers? And this is what we're gonna explore a little bit in this talk. Uh, talking about all those stateful frameworks, there's actually like a pretty uh, nice term and pretty hype term right now, which is called Smack Stack. So the Smack Stack, it's actually, it stands for uh, Spark, uh, Mesos, because Mesos is being used to run all of this. Um, uh, Smack, uh, then we are at Akka, which is used for like actually writing your applications and it's like, um, an actor-based framework <coughs> for Java apps. Uh, then we have CC, which stands for Cassandra. And then at the end, we got Kafka for like the distributed message queue. So this is like a pretty common stack right now. We see people deploying for analyzing or uh, processing big data sets or like more also like in the stream processing world uh, where they want to analyze data. And the challenge we, we have then is if you want to run this, so basically without Mesos, so if you just have like a SAG stack, then you actually end up, uh, what we see also with a lot of customers, you actually you end up with like a subdividing your cluster, you're partitioning your clusters, so you're having like a number of nodes where you would run uh, your Spark stack, you would have a number of nodes where you run your Cassandra stack, and so on, and actually the resource utilization pretty is pretty low, as you really need to uh, gets this for like the maximum uh, like maximum performance and so you're actually wasting a lot of resources and if you're actually going through the smack stack and this is also why I believe it's like such a trendy and hype topic right now you can actually consolidate all of this with like Mesos you're having Mesos underneath or DCOS and you can actually run it on fewer nodes as you can actually share those nodes between the different services but 
Now we've seen, yeah, this is pretty cool, we can uh, reduce all of this, but it actually means we have to write a framework scheduler for that. We have to uh, write framework schedulers for Cassandra, for Spark, and all those services. The good news for you is actually for the Smack stack, we already done that. So that's already like either being finished or it's still like in the process. So that's nothing you personally have to be concerned about. But actually what happens if you want to write your own stateful service, your own stateful framework? And as that being said, it actually is pretty hard because in general distributed systems, uh, you have to deal with like so many different failure scenarios. And I really like this quote, like Murphy's Law for Distributed System. It's not that just that they're simple failures where you can detect, hey, this node just failed, or uh, there's a network partition. Often it's like this partial or failures, which are really hard to all imagine up front when you're designing a framework and all basically being handled. And uh, so actually it's really hard to basically figure out those, all those failures or partial failures in a distributed system. In general, this coming up with a distributed system, it's already quite hard. So this, for example, it's uh, the architecture of ArangoDB, which is like a distributed database. And we see we have like different components. We got coordinators, we got database servers, we got an agency. Uh, so there are actually a lot of components which I need to individually scale, which have different failover semantics. So for example, when the agency fails, I need to do something different than, for example, as if a database server fails. So first of all, coming up with all of this, uh, what transitions you want to have and what you actually want to do is pretty hard by itself. And then actually writing that as a Mesos framework or as a framework on like any distributed scheduler, it's another challenge because you actually, you have to codify all those different failure scenarios. If you set, set it up like manually, you would have like an operator manual which tells you, hey, if the agency fails, you need to do this, this, this. If a database server fails, you need to do this, this, this. And with a f uh, framework or a service, you actually have to codify all of this knowledge in the scheduler. So that's pretty challenging. And uh, you might also have to deal with uh, other like problems. So for example, uh, placement constraints. If you have a stateful service, you might also want to co-locate, for example, data. So if we take, for example, Hadoop as an example, whenever you run Hadoop on HDFS, one of the core ideas is that you actually you co-locate the computation where like the data resides in HDFS. So when you have like the stateful services or also then the data processing on top, you actually you end up with a lot more placement constraints than you would with like stateless services. If in contrast we compare this with like a stateless service, if this was a stateless service, failover would be really, really simple. It would basically be my engine X failed, it doesn't have state, I can restart it on any node in my cluster. But it's different if we have like stateful services. So with stateful services, I really would like to reuse the data. So I'll probably I'll try to restart it like on the same node, just as an example to uh, show how different like stateful and stateless services are. Stateless services they are pretty easy, still challenging, but stateful services are a totally different story. And Mesos is actually doing a lot to help you with that. So especially like from a storage perspective, Mesos is providing a number of primitives which help you to deal with storage. And they're like mainly like three categories. So if you start your default Mesos task, what's gonna happen, you're gonna write all your data into your sandbox. That sandbox, once your task fails, it's basically it's gone. So you're not, you're not able to recover your data. It's, different if you start using so-called persistent or local persistent volumes. They're actually, they're node local storage. So whenever your task fails, when that node gets rebooted, you actually you get re-offered the data you have previously written to that volume, which is a pretty nice thing, especially if you have something like, for example, Cassandra. Cassandra internally already replicates the data, so you can actually live with, if there's like a total node failure. If that node doesn't come back up, uh, that data would still be lost because it's still, it's just a local persistent volume. It's not stored like in any distributed way. It's just stored on that node. 
but as Cassandra internally actually replicates the data, we are happy with that because we can re-replicate and we don't have any lost data as we can always use one of the replicas. If we are using like legacy software, as for example, a single MySQL instance or a single Postgres instance we want to run in our cluster, similar as we did in like the pre-distributed systems world, <coughs> it's slightly different because if we only write the data to a single node and that node where I was running my MySQL instance would fail, actually all my data would be gone. So there I actually need to do something different, so I would use something like external storage, which can either be like, for example, Amazon EBS, or it could be some distributed file system underneath I used to store my MySQL data in. So this is just to show you that Mesos is actually offering different solutions for different kind of applications because many applications have slightly different considerations or slightly different requirements when it comes to storage. And uh, going into detail, like why it's so hard to actually write a framework uh, using those local persistent volumes. Again, this is uh, actually a state diagram. We came up with ArangoDB when we initially came up with the ArangoDB framework, uh, which is similar as the class of like Cassandra frameworks. So Cassand uh, Cassandra and ArangoDB, they use those local persistent volumes because they actually have internal uh, replication and they can actually live with node failures. But we still see it's still pretty hard to basically make sure that we end up with those, those local persistent volumes because what you actually have to do, you first have to reserve resources. You have to make sure that you own basically for your role, for your framework, those, uh, first of all, the disk resources, but you also, you have to be able to still start the task on the same node. So you also want to own CPU and memory resources on the same node. And actually it's a lot of state transitions and uh, writing up that framework, actually we ended up with around like 9,000 lines of C++ code. And this is just really, really a lot for just writing like a scheduler to uh, distribute like a database <coughs> within your cluster or to deploy a database on a Mesos cluster. And when seeing that, that was actually like really motivation for us where we reconsidered this initial idea of Mesos. So Mesos was initially also written to be an SDK to write distributed systems. And at that point we realized it was a great SDK for writing uh, stateless services or stateless frameworks. But now when we're adding all those <coughs> primitives, we might actually want to add something easier to use or simpler to use for framework writers. And this actually brought us to the SDK. So uh, this was the motivation to come up with the SDK. And I would actually briefly hand over to my colleague Ken here, because he's going to start the demo, because it takes a while to deploy. And uh, then we're going to talk about what the SDK is actually doing. Fantastic. Uh, so as, as mentioned, I was a part of the team that uh, started creating this, but I left the team maybe six months ago or so, and it's taken on a completely new uh, set of features, which is really cool. The, the, probably the, the big brain behind it is, uh, if you're familiar with our team, is Gabriel. He's added a, a tremendous amount. Um, so if you're engaged with the community, and you see his name come up. Uh, he has a lot of value to add into this. The, th the other thing I'll add in before I jump into this demo is that, you know, what, what we're doing with the SDK isn't like a scaffolding builder, which is one, at, one way to manage things, right? You could actually build up scaffolding based on state or what you seem to find here in the slides. But another way is to actually provide default behavior, like the behavior is there, and you're configuring that behavior. Um, so uh, let's get started. Um, I am right now, uh, I have a, a cluster established, which is what we're looking at here. It is on DC West, but under the covers, it's, it's Mesos. Um, we have established a custom universe. Uh, and so part of that includes a framework that we've created with the SDK, which we've just called Hello World. Of course, you have to have a Hello World, right? Uh-oh, bad things are about to. Did you make the sacrifices to the demo guides? That doesn't feel like it. Let's see here real quick. Yeah, we're still online, all right. Oh, that didn't happen. <laughs> so um, 
Uh, real quick, if I go into the repositories, if you know uh, a little bit about uh, DCUS, we have a, we have this guy here, uh, which is the Holo World Local, uh, which is an established repository, which has the SDK application in it, the service. So because of that, if we look in the universe, one of the options down here uh, is the Hello World. Uh, what I'm going to do right now is uh, local to that environment. I'm in a Vagrant instance. I'm actually going to just say DCOS. Sorry, can you hold that for a second? This is tough one-handed. Uh, package install Hello World, which is the package name for this thing, and we'll just say install this thing. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot more of the code behind it, but the beautiful part about what we're seeing here is the installation of a, of a service that was created with the SDK, and core to this, uh, and we're going to jump into more details here shortly, is that this framework, the main for this is one, well, uh, the code for this is one class, and that class leverages a YAML that defines the behavior of what we're seeing here, including uh, all the commands that are running. So we'll go into much more detail, and that's I want to emphasize one point. This isn't um, this isn't YAML replaces everything. This is this is an option, and uh, we have the ability to recognize this YAML file to create some behavior around certain features, uh, and we can also add code to this. So we have the ability to configure things with default behavior. We can add code to this, uh, and the end result is we're launching off a service. If we go look at the service, this is going to take a few minutes to deploy. So. Um, while we're watching or waiting for that to deploy, we're going to continue on with the presentation. You can see here that it's staging. By the time we get back to this, we'll have several. This is staging the service, which will then launch off several tasks. We will look at those tasks and look how we might be able to make some configuration changes, either on the fly within the BCOS environment or um, as a developer, creating a whole new aspect of this framework. So, switching back. Thank you very much for showing this. And yeah, let's maybe briefly dive into like what, how the SDK is structured or what it tries to solve. So it's actually, it's built on top of DCUS and Mesos, and uh, it basically, it gives you like um, this approach Ken just mentioned, that it basically gives you default behavior to write services. And we'll see you actually, you have a lot of options to even specify more detailed behavior if you need something more special, but like the general idea is it should be as easy as possible to basically cover the default use case, the default use case of writing a service. And um, so this is what's meant by having like a default scheduler out of the box uh, for providing stateful services. And if you're using that state, uh, this default scheduler, it's actually sufficient to just write a YAML file and that actually is going to create all the code you need for your framework, for your DCOS service, uh, and as we saw, we can then just install it with like this one command, DCOS package install, my cool new package I just created. All right, and this is exactly like the pyramid, as I like to call it, uh, showing it that simple things should be simple. So if I only want to deploy like a single container, it should be, it shouldn't take me like uh, more than 50 lines of code or 50 lines of YAML, for example. Uh, if I want to do more complicated stuff, if I need like certain failover behavior, for example, because I'm writing like a really complex dependencies and I actually need different failover scenarios for different services running with, within my service, uh, I actually, I might have to write some code and uh, those could be like custom plans or custom strategies and Actually, I also have the choice of not really utilizing the SDK to generate all that code for me, but basically, if I'm deciding I might want to write my own framework, I might actually start and look at and just take, for example, the offer evaluation classes from within the SDK and still write my own scheduler, but basically utilizing a lot of this common functionality so when writing your own service, you'll see it's actually, and you actually write several services, you'll see it's like the basic parts, they are often like the same. And you can basically take those classes from the SDK and uh, avoid writing them yourself. There's actually like a fourth option, uh, which is not on here. This would basically be writing your scheduler from scratch, which is for example, what we saw before with the example of a RangerDB. 
when the RangerDB started, this wasn't around, so you still have like this option uh, if you need something totally which doesn't fit into the SDK. You maybe you want to write Marathon, for example. Marathon would be like not such a good fit for this uh, SDK. It's, it's really like focused not for meta schedulers, what Marathon is, but more for like really a stateful uh, service. In that case, it's you. It could still be sense. It could still make sense to basically write it entirely from scratch, which is like adding even more lines of code you would have to write. But if you're within this domain. And as I said, you just want to have your default scheduler. It's a simple YAML file. You don't have to be concerned about uh, what, what's actually going underneath. You don't really have to understand too much uh, what's going on in DCOS underneath. Is you're just specifying, for example, run this one Docker container for me. If you actually, if you're dealing with uh, custom plans and strategies, you might actually have to write a little code, and you should understand why you need these custom plans. If you, you need some more understanding of your application, you can't just take like a Docker image and say run it. You should really understand what's going on underneath. What is the dependency between different parts of your applications underneath? But you still, you don't need like specific knowledge underneath, like how does Mesos uh, allocate all those persistent volumes? Uh, do I need to reserve resources first? This is basically all taken care of you by the SDK. And actually, this upper part, like the default scheduler and the custom plans and strategies, this is what we want to focus on in this talk. As down here, like writing your own scheduler, that's probably like at least like, on its own, probably like more than 40 minutes, because it's, it's a really complex topic. So we'll focus like what you can utilize the SDK for to generate all this code for you. And here, we actually we have a simple example, like a hello world. It's basically, it's just writing hello world into like a, a persistent volume. We <laughs> allocate it. And like the interesting part here is, this is all specified in YAML, but what's actually happening underneath, and we'll see this uh, on the next slide, uh, it's actually, it's the same, I could use the same in Java. So I don't really have to have this trade of like, either YAML, which would be more like a configuration file, or Java, but it's actually, uh, it's, it's both, because the YAML is not used as a configuration file, it's actually used to generate the same Java code we saw uh, on the other slide here. Uh, looking at the YAML, for example, like this part down here, where we create the uh, persistent volume, this is like, this would take so much more lines if I actually have to do that myself, because as mentioned before, this actually implies we are reserving resources, this implies we are creating a persistent volume, and here it's basically like a really nice specification, and uh, the code is doing all of this will be generated for us in the background. All right, as mentioned, here's the same in Java, so I can actually do everything I can do there, I can also do in Java, and uh, there I actually even have more options if I want to uh, do like more detailed plans if I want own uh, recovery plans, for example. And plans, it's another really interesting topic. So uh, we, as we saw before, we specified like this task. So let me just switch back maybe. So here, here we actually we have a task called server. And the server ha actually has a goal that it's running. And uh, if we now go to this plan, we actually see it's uh, referencing certain steps. So a plan is consisting of certain steps, and they can, those individual steps can have different goals. So for example, the goal we saw before it was that it's running. Running actually means that it keeps on running as well. It's like a long-lived thing. There can be other goals as well, as for example, the format stage here. Format is something which you want to do once in the beginning. We don't want to keep on formatting our uh, persistent volume over and over again. We want to do that once in the beginning and set up everything. So that's actually a task uh, stage which would have the goal finished. And finished means it's done once, and once that's finished, I'm happy and all is good, basically. So, just 
just, I, I, maybe it was clear, but like a normal strategy when you have something like, this is a great example, this is HDFS, right? In order for this service to land somewhere in a Mesos cluster, there's a certain order of things. Uh, that, it's important that that order is followed exactly. So if you're not familiar with HDFS, the first thing I need is three journal nodes. And I need those landed on three separate nodes. That's a strategy for how to land those things. Uh, that's codified somewhere, but you can see here that the first phase is the journal node phase. The next thing that needs to happen is a name node needs to land, and there's certain rules for that. Those name nodes have to land first one at a time, and two, they have to land on a journal node. So the strategies for how that happens is codified somewhere, but it's detailed here, the order of things. So the concept that we have within the DCOS uh, SDK is that you have a plan, and that plan has phases, and those phases have steps. And that's, that's what you would detail on the order of things. And you can see here that it's all defined serially. And at the bottom here, you can see that there's a strategy for the data node, which is parallel. So these things have to happen in a serial order. It's, it's important to maintain the order of those things. But as soon as we have kind of the infrastructure of, these, I'm sorry, the infrastructure of HDFS up and running, in other words, journal nodes and name nodes are in place, that they've been formatted, and then we've bootstrapped the second name node so we have fault tolerance. Then we can have any number of, of data nodes, and we don't care how they land. We could land uh, 20 minutes at a time, and nobody cares, right? Uh, from a, from an infrastructure standpoint. So that's that's a little bit more detail on specifying plans, and that becomes an important concept for how things are managed within the SDK. Thank you. And I actually think we're going to have a slide. Uh, where is it for this? Uh, actually, failure recovery, like this, what we saw here. It's, it's like a great way of setting up a service, but actually, once the service is running, or even while we are deploying this, we have to deal with failures, because failures are just inherent to distributed systems. And that's actually why the SDK also gives us like a number of options. I can specify the failure recovery, or how I want to react to failures. So in general, there are like three kind of stages or pools. There's like running, and once it's running, all is good. But there's also stop, and there's permanently failed. Stop could, for example, be I simply cannot uh, reach it at the moment. And then there's a failure monitor, which I can actually also specify, basically saying after a certain timeout, uh, I want to, this task to move over to the permanently failed one, and then I actually, the recovery manager is going to be responsible for keep starting another task, which I can also basically deal with how I want to do that, uh, because it's very different. So for example, if I have a Cassandra node failing, I might have different considerations. How do I want to re-replicate the data? Do I maybe want to wait longer for that to come back up? And once I'm in the permanently failed state, how do I actually re-replicate the data so I end up with three replicas again after one of them failed? So those are like all points where it can customize the behavior, but for all of those steps, there's also like default behavior. So if you have like something simple where you can just like restart it, uh, you don't have to worry. If you have something more specific, First, you have like all those dependencies and uh, considerations how you want to re-replicate data. You have the option of doing so as well. And uh, here we just have uh, again an example for uh, my uh, for HDFS, uh, just showing how easy it is to basically have customized failover recovery. So again, it's like it's a plan we generate, and down here, I hope you can see that back there. It's actually, it's just generating the steps we want to do for this failure recovery. So, and it's actually, it's uh, the same steps we would do initially uh, when setting up the system, we would bootstrap and uh, then actually do the step of server as well. And there's some code omitted, but if you just look at the S code, you can actually see that in detail. And that allows you to really specify how you want to do failover recovery. How does it work internally? So we already talked a lot about a schedulers, tasks, and persistent volumes. So maybe just to, uh, for those who might not be familiar with those terms, a scheduler is basically this component uh, coordinating a service, so like the distributed version of like the coordinator running in a cluster. 
And then we have tasks which are like running on individual nodes. And for persistence, they might have those persistent volumes we talked about in the Mesos context, which will be still available like after a node failure or after my task got restarted. And so these are like the basic concepts we also saw like with our Hello World scheduler. And once we have the scheduler within DCS, we actually use Marathon to launch all of them in like a all tolerant fashion because also the scheduler could fail, right? And in this case, in DCOS, Marathon is actually going to recognize, hey, my Hello World scheduler failed and I want to restart it. So uh, that's kind of like the init system for your cluster in this sense. And the main idea uh, of this SDK is that it actually gives you a declarative way of specifying what you want. We saw this YAML file before. Here we actually we made it a little more complex as we split like it in two, two uh, steps, in two parts. Uh, we split it into the hello and into the world part. And imagine now we are specifying here an update. So as mentioned, it's declarative. So I'm not saying like how I should switch over there, but I'm basically saying I now want, isn't there some highlighting? Okay. Uh, highlighting was dropped. So actually uh, what, what I'm saying is I'm changing the CPU requirement for the server uh, down in the uh, hello part and I'm actually changing the instance count in the world example. And so while now I specified what I want to reach and what the SDK in this case will do for you, it'll generate a deployment plan. And this deployment plan is actually cons will consist of two phases. It's first going to be the update for Hello World, where we change the uh, number of CPUs. And it's going to be an update for the world phase, where we increase the number of instances. And those are like two independent phases. And the interesting part is also what happens if there are failures in between. So just imagine uh, we've done with our Hello phase. We actually we updated the resource requirements. And now the scheduler fails. Uh, what's going to happen is Mesos is going to do like a task reconciliation and the uh, first the scheduler will be restarted by Marathon. We're going to do a task reconciliation and we'll actually recognize hello, this update, this phase was complete. This is all like what we wanted to reach. There we are, we are in our target state and we actually we just need to consider like the second uh, phase here, the world phase and roll that out. And so internally, from, from like a structure, how that's happening, we're actually having a plan coordinator who's like uh, generating them and managing them. And we actually, we're not just having one plan within the system. So the two we saw before were like the deployment plan, which is like the initial deployment. And then we also have a plan to deal with failover. Again, they're like also given their defaults given to you but you can override them as well in YAML slash in Java uh, when you want to specify more behavior. And down there, it's actually then, so <coughs> steps are generated and the plan scheduler will, will then actually take care of executing them and uh, making sure that all this meso stuff down there on the right, like the offers, the generation of uh, new uh, reservations, of new persistent volumes, it's all taken care of you and you don't have to worry about it in your steps. One, one important aspect of what you see here is that those two plans are run concurrently. Uh, we could be in, the, in some phase or in between phases on deployment plans, have a, have a failure that occurred previously, which is required a step in order to continue a phase. The recovery plan will kick in because of the failure and then it will continue on the deployment plan. Those are concurrent plans. It's important to recognize them. And actually it's not just if I want, I can actually even specify more plans. So I'm not just restricted to deployment or recovery plan, I can even have more running in parallel. Um, other features. So actually, it's even giving you more uh, uh, than we saw here. So it also gives you like placement constraints, which is similar if you have worked with Marathon before, where you can spread out stuff, where you can say unique host, for example. It gives you something similar. And it actually it also integrates into like the DCS load balancing aspect, so it's really easy to integrate into this uh, ecosystem DCS is providing to you. Um, and 
the, in my opinion, nicest part is basically like this fail over recovery is that it's really easy to also plug in certain parts if you have more uh, special requirements than the default given to you, which often is the case for if you have fa failing tasks or want to deal with failover. Uh, so there it's really easy to specify like your own set of implementations. And that actually now brings us to the demo. I hope the deployment has finished by now. Let's hope. <laughs> uh, one other uh, added aspect of what we're seeing here is that um, when, you, uh, when you're using the SDK, um, there, the plan execution, by default, when you're provisioning, initially provisioning, it just follows the plan. Like when it succeeds a step, it moves to the next step, and it just keeps going. But there are times when like, you do a configuration update uh, or maybe an upgrade, you actually might want to pause. You, you may want a human involved during a certain process, right? So you're upgrading to something. You may want to upgrade a node and then uh, have a human or, or some kind of automated test that would verify that that transformation happened correctly. Uh, assuming that it did happen correctly, then you might want to just continue. So all the interactions of like uh, initiate this plan, uh, okay, pause, let me, let me check it out. Okay, that looks good, or hey, roll that back. That's all baked into the SDK as well. That's included, that's not something we talked about uh, on slide, but it's one of the other benefits that happens. Let's switch back out, and you can see now that uh, not only do we have a scheduler, and it might even be hard to figure out what's what, but if I, if I click here, you can see we have a scheduler that's running. Um, you can see here that we have um, a world, three of them, and we have three hellos that are running. These are all tasks that we're asked to run. If we switch back um, to here, you can see this is the YAML. This is like the simplest example of just using YAML uh, to create an application, of course. Um, if you look at the examples over here, we have frameworks. The one we're looking at is Hello World, but the other examples would be HDFS and Kafka. You may not be able to see it, but Kafka is the other example. Those are going to be more Java intense uh, and, and provide a lot more detail. But if you're looking for just a quick get the world running example, this hello world example, the thing that might be a little bit off is like we have these um, uh, mustache variables that are gonna be replaced in the universe packaging. And so if we look at the installation of that application, I just did a quick uh, DCOS package install of hello world. Uh, I could have also added some, some variables. I could have said, yeah, we want two of those instead of three of those, uh, as in the example that was uh, shown to us. And then the thing that's actually executing is we're just like executing some value going into, the whole point is using the persistent volume and then providing some sleep. Fairly simple idea. Uh, and the world is similar in nature. And then we have some configuration option for the duration of sleep. So uh, that's the application that's actually running. We have three of them. Why don't we go out here and make a change to this? Uh, let's edit this. Uh, let's see here. Been too long since I've done this. Configuration, edit. Uh, well, we could edit here. That's not exactly what we want to do. Um, let's. Yeah, I lost my train of thought here. Oh, here, you want to hold this while I navigate this? Let's, let's go through the process of what this would look like if we really wanted to change something. Let's go to the universe uh, where this package was installed. Uh, if we want to install it again, assuming it comes back. No. I'm really taxing my computer at this point. Hello world example, not from the command line option, but from uh, the UI. We can see here, go into advanced options. This is the sleep duration variable that will be replaced. This is the whole hello and the world. This correlates to what we see here. We have a hello and we have a world. You can see here that we have a count for world. If we switch back here, in the world, we actually have a count. 
If we look at the installation that's currently running, you'll see that there's three of them running. We could have easily said, I, I really only want one of those things running up. Right? I have, I've created an environment where I've defined what needs to run, how it will land, by the fact that it will actually ask for a, a persistent volume, it will land on that persistent volume. If this process were to fail, uh, it will be restarted on that same node because it has a persistent volume there. Uh, and we can make configuration changes, as you can see here, um, all, all detailed in the whole DCOS environment. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I think there's more slides. Can you just switch back, please? So, actually, the nice thing about this SDK is it's like we're not just giving it out, but we actually heavily use it internally. So, uh, we actually use it to write all those, basically, the smack stack we saw before uh, with the services. So, that was also one of the main motivations because we really needed it to not duplicate all the code between all those frameworks to have like a common infrastructure between both of them. And yeah, it's actually also used by a number of partners. So for example, Uber is using uh, the Cassandra work uh, quite heavily. Uh, Bing is actually using Kafka on DCOS and Verizon is also like using Cassandra and Kafka. So those are actually services which are in production at relatively large scale and which is also like confirmation for us that we are like moving in a good direction uh, with this SDK here. Maybe the current uh, caveats, uh, the current challenges. So it's still under very active development. So while developing all this Cassandra Kafka services, we are also trying to get, it's all basically anytime we implement something in the Cassandra or Kafka framework, we have to decide, is this now something Cassandra specific? Or is it something which should move in the, uh, into the SDK because it's relevant also for other services? And so this is why there's still like quite heavy development going on in the SDK. And in my opinion, the most needed part is actually like the uh, developer documentation, making it actually easy for other people to use. So if you come to the repo, uh, you might uh, see that the documentation needs to keep up with like the state of development. And maybe like the second challenge is uh, the restriction that it's actually Java based right now. So if you're for example RangoDB which wrote it in C++ the entire scheduler, this might be like a downside for you. But uh, on the other hand, it actually allows us to move quickly forward and basically reach a state where we can have all this, all our the entire smack stack basically developed by this and thereby extract all the best practices. Once that is done, we'll actually will consider other language options as for example like Go most likely as like a next step. But we first want to understand what are like the components we all need in this SDK to enable all services on top. So uh, that being mentioned, like many planned features we want to have in this SDK are still not in there yet, which also goes with like the very active development. So you might, if you start using it as of today, if you start playing with, you might miss some features, but you can be sure there's like a large roadmap and they'll be most likely be added. Otherwise, just open a GitHub issue with the features you're missing. So uh, what's next? If you're actually considering to write your own service, just try it out. As mentioned, it's still like under some flux, but it's really nice to just get it. Maybe just deploy this Hello World service, which is in the examples folder, and just get a feeling for what it means to write services and what it takes to also deploy services on your own DCOS cluster. And what we also try to achieve with this talk is actually get feedback on whether this is something you can use or whether you're missing features, because we use it like for our for the services we are developing, but we actually want it to be for you guys developing services and basically get feedback from you. What are you missing for your service? What could we do to make it easier for you to write like a stateful service? And yeah, bonus wise, if you really like it, go to the GitHub repo, open issues if you don't like stuff, otherwise maybe leave it a star and uh, give us hints what you actually uh, need or what you like about it. And yeah, that's basically our presentation. And I would say we still have some minutes for questions, or? Oh, time for questions. 
there's one. So uh, on the GitHub, there's some docs in the docs folder. That also includes stuff about the plan. I've looked at this bit before, and mm -hmm. I haven't seen plans before. Uh, yeah, this is the part which we mentioned under the current challenges slide, that it's rapidly moving. Uh, so uh, that will be updated soon. That was recently added. So just wait for a while. Uh, should be there soon. Some mic? Yeah. I, my voice carries, but I want, yeah. Um, if you see here on the getting quick started and what you've noticed in the demo that I provided, there's some um, expectations on dependencies you know, that you have Git, VirtualBox, and Vagrant. That is not necessary for the DCOS Commons, or uh, yeah, DCOS Commons. By the way, that may have a name change, um, probably more associated with SDK. But uh, that is useful in getting a quick start. Uh, everything that you see me running and doing a demo on now is actually running locally on my own box. So if, if that's important to you, which I think it is for many, um, it, it's kind of nice to not need a whole cluster out there or figure out how to deploy an ECOS cluster or, or whatever the challenges might be. That's uh, mitigated by, by leveraging this framework here. It obviously is gonna pull down a bunch of images and it might take a bit uh, you, you're going to need a, some good bandwidth in order to achieve success, but other than that, it's useful. Further questions? Um, thank you very much, and keep on writing stateful services. Thanks.